The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. Hi, everybody. This is Jason Rosenbaum a political correspondent with St. Louis Public Radio. During her journalism career, NPR's Sarah McCammon got to cover critical election cycles, including the 2016 presidential campaign where evangelical voters helped solidify Republican Donald Trump's road to the White House. McCammon, who grew up in an evangelical household in the Kansas City area, said she often found her professional life intersecting with her religious background. And this melding of her professional and personal life was one of the reasons she wrote The Exvangelicals, Loving, Living, and Leaving the White Evangelical Church. This is a gripping and incisive examination of how evangelical Christianity affected politics and people. And I talked with McCammon last month at St. Louis Public Radio about her book and how it was a deeply personal experience writing it. Here's my conversation with NPR's Sarah McCammon. Welcome to St. Louis. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you for coming. And uh, as as all of you will find out in in, in this book, uh, Sarah is a native Missourian. I am. And uh, I, are 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 you a sports? Are you a fan of any of the Kansas City teams? Or, or only are you, when they're succeeding. Yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of don't pay attention to sports, but when the Chiefs or the Royals are, you know, doing well, like when they're about ready to win one of those big tournaments, whatever those are called, um, then I watch. Yeah. That's, that's fair. I mean, I, I, I'm a Chicago White Sox fan and a Chicago Bears fan and a Tampa Bay Lightning fan, but I'm also weird. So we'll, 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 we'll leave the sports talk uh to the side because we're not here to talk about sports. We're here to talk about this extraordinary book, The Exvangelicals. And I don't, I don't, I'm not just saying that because uh, I ha- I was, you know, asked to interview you. Like, this is one of the best books I've read in the last few years. And I highly recommend every one of you buy it, uh, which we'll talk about afterwards. And I think the reason why I felt this book was so gripping to me is even though the subject matter is very specific, it's about your journey away from evangelicalism and talking to lots of people about it. I found myself relating to a lot of the subject matter, which I think you actually wrote about today that a lot of people are are telling you that exact same thing, even though they may not have the same religious experience to you. I, I would like you to talk about that. Well, one of the things, one of the themes of this book is just really trying to make sense of the world and and especially in a society where you know, we we have this wonderful, diverse, pluralistic country that's made up of so many different cultures and religions and backgrounds. And how do we contend with our differences? How do we make sense of those? We all have our traditions that mean something to us and our backgrounds. And sometimes the things that we're told might not align with the things that we observe or experience. And so I think I think it is, a, you know, a journey that many people can relate to whether or not they grew up evangelical. I grew up evangelical. It's a particularly influential movement in this country in our politics. And and so um, as, we'll t- as we'll discuss, I-, I found my work intersecting with my personal background in ways I, I didn't really expect, but but felt like I wanted to explore. Yeah, well, there's a couple of like uh, construction things about this book that I wanted to ask you about. One of the n- notable things is you talk to a lot of people. This isn't just you quoting a bunch of articles. Like you talk to what? dozens hundreds of people for this book i looked at my i did i recorded all of them because i'm a radio person and i looked at my files and i think i had a, close to 100 audio interviews now not all of them were ex-evangelicals some were experts but yeah what what how did you what was the process to get some of these people to talk with you because as you mentioned some of them are prominent people in the ex-evangelical community but some of them are just just regular people i'd be interested to hear what your process was to connecting with them yeah well I, if I can go back just a little bit to kind of how I started paying attention to this word exvangelical, you know, sometimes you experience things that you don't have a language for. And, and once there's a word for it, it, it sort of, it's like feeling very sort of seen and described. And I had had my own, um, 
religious journey as a younger person in my 20s, trying to kind of figure out, you know, and I talk about this in the book, really trying to figure out how to make sense of people of other faiths, of my grandfather, who I, who's a main character in this book, who um, was not religious. And that was like a really big problem for our family. Um, but I had had my own, you know, really complicated and sometimes painful experience with trying to trying to sort of be true to what I felt and what I felt was right, but also wanting to sort of honor my family and my tradition. And that happened, you know, I'm in my early 40s, so that was about 20 years ago. But when I was covering the Trump campaign, I, I, like so many other reporters, was doing a lot of reporting on white evangelicals, you know, would they embrace Trump, would they not? And in the course of that reporting, I ran across this word exvangelical. Um, it was a word that some people were using. And I, I just started paying attention to it. And so I started following, you know, social media groups, Facebook groups, uh, hashtags on TikTok and Twitter and elsewhere, and kind of discovered this whole world of of online community and also podcasts um, around this idea of, okay, I grew up in this back in this community and it doesn't make sense to me anymore, particularly at this moment of such political, uh, such political divide. Where do I go next? So I began in many cases reaching out to people I saw. Some of the people I interviewed, like Promise Inlow is like a TikTok in ex-evangelical influencer. <laughs> um, others were just individual people that I saw sort of pouring out their hearts in these private social media groups that I was in. And, and I would reach out to people individually and say, hey, could I interview you? Could we talk more about this theme? And and a lot of people, you know, they were already semi-public because they were on social media spaces, were happy to to hop on the phone with me or Zoom and, and talk. Um, and then others were people that I knew in real life, and, and including my own brother uh, and others. And we'll, we'll get to that later. Yeah. But I, I want to go to the Trump campaign, and this will be a good... Uh, segue for you to read from part of your book, because as a non-evangelical and as a Missouri political reporter, uh, when when Donald Trump won Missouri in 2016 by 19 points and he won some of the rural areas, which are heavily evangelical by 80 percent to 20 percent, I mean, I went there and asked why, uh, because I was pretty surprised by it. But I want you to maybe read from your book about your experiences um, covering the Trump campaign and seeing some of that voting shift for yourself. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so this is just to give a little context so that I don't have to read for 10 minutes. This will be about three minutes. Um, just before I get to this to this part that I'm going to read to you, I was describing something I'd experienced in my church as a young girl. If any of you grew up in church, maybe you went to Easter pageants. And um, I went to one as a little girl that was extremely graphic. Um, and I talk about the the sort of fear and confusion I felt seeing like fake blood on Jesus and all this stuff. And, um, and then as part of that scene, there was a, an angry crowd, which if you're familiar with the story of, you know, the crucifixion, people are yelling, yelling at Jesus and, 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 um, angrily harassing him. Okay. So that's sort of the, the scene just before this. By the end of 2016, I had become accustomed to being yelled at by angry crowds of people. Assigned to cover the Donald Trump campaign as a correspondent for NPR, it felt almost routine to those of us in the press pen to huddle over our laptops, rushing to meet deadlines while people pass by to shout insults at us. However large our egos may be in the national media, I don't intend to compare myself to Jesus here. But there were frightening moments in those angry crowds. It also wasn't unusual to engage in warm, friendly conversations with rally goers, often as they were arriving and Elton John's tiny dancer blared over the loudspeaker. They might have made a joke about the liberal media at my expense, but many were equally happy to talk and tell me why they felt so seen and inspired by this real estate developer from New York City. And then the music would amp up, Trump took the stage, and the atmosphere would shift. The crowd took on its own energy as Trump pointed toward the risers and cameras at the back of the room, complaining about those disgusting reporters who were the worst people. This quickly became a part of his shtick, a highlight of every rally. Trump would whip the audience into an excited frenzy as they turned to point at us and laugh. In my reporting for NPR, I often describe this moment as very much like a rock concert, in which Trump's attacks on the press functioned like one of his greatest hits that the audience would demand to hear before they could leave satisfied. You could feel the catharsis in the air as these crowds poured out their frustrations with the economy, with immigrants, with the Washington establishment that they felt disdained them and directed them at us. 
Men in red MAGA hats shook their fists and tried to stare us down. I'll always remember one grandmotherly-looking woman in Colorado who leaned in toward the reporter's pen, pointing and shouting, You're disgusting! We were, it seemed, representatives of the hated establishment on their turf, and we were more than a sufficient proxy. But I wasn't part of that, or I hadn't felt that I was. I had moved to Washington part-time to cover this campaign and spent months reporting on the Republican Party's evangelical base, leaving behind a spouse and two young children in Georgia, feeling nervous and out of my element after spending most of my life and career in the Midwest and South. These people in the crowds were, in reality, my people, white, largely Midwestern or Southern Christians. They looked, sounded, and believed a lot like people in the evangelical community where I'd first learned about God and about politics. When I interviewed them, they'd often bring up their Christian beliefs and their fears about the direction in which they felt the country was going. They saw Trump as someone who could get the country back on track. So, but a side question for you. I've been to three Trump rallies, and I always found it very odd that uh, one of the songs was Funeral for a Friend, Love Lies Bleeding by Elton John, which is an 11 or 12 minute song, uh, which has, uh, did you... Did you find the track list? To, uh, you probably heard the track list hundreds of times. Did mm -hmm. you find it to be very odd? I mean, I don't know. I It was just, I mean, some of it was kind of fun. It was like classic. It was, you know, yeah. Beatles, or I think not Beatles, but Elton John, obviously, and Rolling Stones. And But, you know, you hear it You hear it dozens of times. and white noise. Yeah, wow. yeah. But, my, my colleagues and I who covered that campaign would text each other when we'd randomly hear, you know, Tiny Dancer in the shopping mall or something and be like, oh, my gosh. Well, but, to turn it back to your actual point, I appreciate But I should just say most reporters have PTSD from campaign playlists, regardless of the politician. Understood. <laughs> I think that the thing that I had a lot of trouble reconciling, which you talked about in your book, is, you know, I remember the Clinton impeachment vividly as a, an older millennial and how many people in the evangelical community and religious right, like, called on him to resign, said what he was doing was moral and wrong. And yet when Donald Trump came along, who he's clearly an adulterer and he is very coarse and he has told just straight up lies all the time. It seems like a lot of people are willing to look past that. And I'd like you to kind of talk about that phenomenon because you, you touch on it pretty specifically in this book. I do. And I mean, this was a point that was made, right, quite a bit. Um, the, many people saw what they felt was hypocrisy on the part of the evangelical movement in terms of how they responded to Trump's character um, versus how they'd responded to for example, Bill Clinton's character. And I remember that vividly. You know, I was 17 in 1998 when the Clinton Lewinsky uh, stuff was happening. And I write in the book about I happened to be a Senate page in, in D.C. right as this was sort of heating up just after the news broke. And, you know, I, I have such clear memories of people like James Dobson, um, who was the founder of Focus on the Family and remains um, an influential evangelical leader in the political sphere, but really started out as... A, sort of a family psychologist type of person, um, him, it, Dobson and, and, and others being very vocally critical of Clinton and saying things like character matters. You know, we have to have a president who exhibits moral character. And um, I mean, this isn't news, but I remember it so well because I was inside that world. And so then to fast forward to 2015, 16, and to be covering the Trump campaign, I was just curious, you know, how would my former community respond to this? Um, and it was it was such a different response. And that that really is kind of what the story uh, was about that I was reporting when I first heard the word exvangelical. I was interviewing evangelical women right after the release of the Access Hollywood video who were some of whom were saying, look, you know, this is this is a community that's talked about purity and monogamy and fidelity. And, and, and they're and even this isn't isn't too much. And I think there was a real sense for some uh, of disillusionment and, and betrayal. And it seems like, and this is another thing you touch on, is the concept of biblical literalism and how some people like take some parts of the Bible and hyper focus on it, but then don't focus on other parts. Um, and I think that really becomes pronounced when you're talking about like the LGBTQ community, which is another big part of your book. Um, that seems like it seems like not only for you that was a big reason why you broke with the evangelical church, but it seems like a common thread about why others are. And when I say that, I mean the evangelical church's 
pretty strident opposition to the LGBTQ community. So I'd like you to, to touch on that. It is a major theme. Um, and there's data, there has been for years now, really, that suggests that, you know, younger evangelicals, even those who identify as evangelical, are much more accepting of, of queer people, of, of same-sex marriage. And so I think that that is a theme I run across a lot in ex-evangelical spaces, um, whether it's because people themselves are, are you know, I, I talk in the book about a good friend of mine who um, I remember since we were in, I think, kindergarten together, who, you know, slowly, came, painfully came to terms with being gay, uh, despite really not wanting to be because of the way he'd been raised. Um, but you know, he t- he talked to me about some of the some of the books in his home that were based on a literalistic view of scripture, and um, and just the pain and the, the you know the real anguish he went through trying to to come to terms with who he was and who he w- he was told he needed to be, and and then you know one of the um, experts I interviewed for this book, David Gushy, who's a uh, Christian ethicist at Mercer University, um, and has written a book about sort of his own process of shifting his views on this issue. Um, you know, he said a lot of people he meets, younger people as a college professor, are leaving their churches in part because of solidarity with their gay friend, gay and lesbian friends. They, they don't want to be part of something that's, that's exclusive, uh, excluding people that they love. Mm-hmm. Did you, when you talked with the hundred or so people, including the people that left the church did they also cite abortion and and the and the evangelical churches opposition to abortion rights as one of the reasons they left or did they still hold on to their opposition to abortion even after they left to the, the evangelical church you know each person was different i i think more broadly what i can speak to in that regard is is just sort of the the views of women um i you know i talked to quite a few women who felt marginalized in their churches. Um, you know, all churches, it's, evangelicalism is a big movement and there's a spectrum of belief and practice. And I think it's important to say that. And some churches are more, are less literalistic. Some are more accepting of like evolutionary theory than mine was or my Christian school. And some allow women to be in leadership, but many do not. And I think for a lot of women, that feeling that they were always sort of a second class citizen in their religious spaces became very painful. And at the same time, um, the, you know, the purity movement, which was really big in the, in the 90s when I was a teenager, um, which had this, you know, very rigid view of, of sexuality, of what was acceptable, and, and the kind of dire warnings about ever going outside the lines. Um, I think that imposed particular shame on, on women because they felt, we felt a responsibility to protect men, to cover ourselves, to, to avoid being a temptation to men. And, um, you know, a lot of women in these in this sort of evangelical community have described feeling a real shame just about their having a female body. Um, I didn't ask about abortion as much, to be honest. Yeah, I know you do talk about that uh, abortion in the book, but I, I was, touch on it. Yeah. yeah, but I want you. I want to go back to what I also felt was the most striking part of the book, which was less about the political content, which was was great as a political reporter. I loved reading about it, but it was more about how evangelicalism is this all-encompassing culture where you went to school with other evangelicals, you socialized with them, you're expected to marry. Um, And I think that you have another passage where you would describe that better than I can. Yeah, well, I'll I'll set this up just a little bit. Um, One of the chapters is called A Parallel Universe, and it really describes the, the ways in which my world was carefully curated. I, you know, I, I went to Christian school, uh, church on Sunday, sometimes in the middle of the week. Almost everybody that we knew was an evangelical Christian. We, you know, we thought anyone who wasn't a Christian was was going to help, and that included even some people who would call themselves Christians. We were skeptical about Catholics. We were skeptical about mainline Protestants. It was a very narrow little box, <laughs> and um, and and so. But one person who fell outside of that box was my grandfather. This chapter is called People Need the Lord, and I'm just going to read again in about three minutes from it. Some of you might recognize that line. Um, (laughs) Dear Lord, I prayed, thank you for this food and for this day, and I pray that Grandpa will get saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Every night, the six of us, my parents, two sisters, my brother, and me, gathered around our antique wooden kitchen table, and someone prayed a version of that prayer for my grandfather. 
I didn't know much about him, only that his house was filled with interesting objects and artwork and books, and that he played classical music on the grand piano in his living room, that the kitchen smelled of garlic and sherry from his beloved cooking projects, and that he always had at least one cat lurking around the house. I knew that he was a brain surgeon, and I understood that was something we were proud of. But I couldn't understand why he didn't love Jesus, the man with the gentle face surrounded by the herd of fluffy sheep in the tiny framed painting on my bedroom shelf. What I did know was that Grandpa and my aunts and uncles were going to hell. Like everyone who didn't believe in Jesus, their souls were in great danger. We had to pray for them, my parents told us, and whenever we saw them, we had to be a witness, be friendly, respectful, and well-behaved, so as to show them the light of Jesus. Being evangelical meant evangelizing, sharing the news of Jesus with everyone we could before it was too late. And this was especially urgent for the people we loved most, our family. If they could see Jesus shining through us, they might be drawn to him and understand that they were lost in the darkness and that if they would simply believe and pray to receive him into their hearts, they could become better people here on earth and then, when they died, go to heaven with us. Though we feared an eternity of separation from our family members who would be in hell while we were in heaven, my parents seemed cautious about spending time with them while we were together here on earth. Grandpa lived only a few miles away, but we didn't see him much, mostly at holidays and major family gatherings. No sleepovers, no group vacations, no hanging out at Grandpa's house. We probably spent more time there for the few years of my life when my grandmother, whom I called Mima, was alive, but that's only a fuzzy memory of a memory. She was gone not long after my third birthday. So on the occasions we visited Grandpa's house, I was on my best behavior. The stakes could not have been higher. My childish disobedience, even my failure to exhibit the joy of Jesus that should be clearly radiating from my heart, could cost my relatives their very souls. Carrying that heavy truth, I put on a smile. Well, I want to touch on, I, I want to continue on the topic of hell and the fun, fear fun the, topic. and the fear of hell. <laughs> I mean, there are, I keep saying like one of the most striking parts of the book, there's like, there's, there's more strikes here than you know, either baseball or labor unions, but that's my <laughs> poor attempt at humor today. But what you, I mentioned I was going to talk to you about your brother and how both of you went to therapy because you actually felt religious trauma and were so traumatized by your experience as a, at growing up evangelical that you needed to talk to somebody when you were older. And I'm actually pretty curious about this after reading it. What is kind of the general thought of the evangelical church towards things like depression or neurodivergence or post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, I think I can guess what their their reaction is to those things, but I'd like to hear it from you. Well, I I can't speak again to the whole movement, yes, but I, I'm, I'm, I apologize for being general, but I want to just, I'm just curious about that topic. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I will say that when I was growing up, um, you know, at times struggling with with depression, frankly, as, as especially as I got um, a little bit older and in, in middle school, and I think was was feeling all this tension in my family around my grandfather and just trying to make sense of things. Um, I remember, you know, uh, talking to my parents about it, and and I would hear things, and I know that I'm not alone in this. I would hear things like, um, "We'll just pray through it," you know, "Take it to the Lord," um, and believe me, I tried. Like I tried that, and um, I think there is an understanding more and more. You know, there's also there's also a uh, you know uh, there are many seminaries that have have counseling programs. Some of them are more and less rooted in mainstream psychology. Um, so there is, I think, an understanding among many evangelicals that mental health is mental um, health challenges are no different than physical health challenges. They all need care, but there there are some who think of them as spiritual problems and, and frame them in those terms. And I, I think that one of the reasons that really struck a chord with me is, you know, it kind of gets to this whole concept of truth and kind of the different versions of truth that you may be encountered as a child. I mean, I've encountered that when reporting on like COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy and how people believed things like the vaccine had microchips in them because they read that on Facebook or it was going to change their genetic engineering or something. But 
I want you to kind of talk about this whole concept of truth and how some some evangelicals, I, I'm, I'm correcting myself, see a different version of truth than maybe others. And I would, would just say, I, I don't think this is exclusive to evangelicals. I think, you know, there's a term I, I hear in the religious trauma space um, from psychologists and I think so, sociologists too. Uh, there's a term called sort of high control religion or high demand religion. And, um, you know, the idea is that in religious traditions and, you know, within within each religious tradition, there are sub traditions, right? And so I, I'm always hesitant to paint anything with a broad brush because, because you know, I think, I mean, personally, I think taking a religious tradition and, you know, bringing your your heart and your brain to bear is a wonderful thing. And for, for many people, being religious can be really meaningful and, and, and helpful. And so I'm not, I'm not here to be against religion, but I think there is a way that some people approach it that's, that's very rigid and that requires rejecting ideas and and facts that intrude on the narrative that's being perpetuated by usually those in leadership. And I talk about this in early in the book, you know, the way that it hit me when I heard Kellyanne Conway right after Trump's inauguration talk about having alternative facts. It really reminded me of the mindset of some of the, the people I was around growing up, including, you know, my teachers who told me that the earth was 6,000 years old because the Bible said so. And there was really no fact that could um, contradict that way of thinking. Um, and that always created a lot of cognitive dissonance for me. Like I just had the sense that, um, and I think for many people who are raised in environments like that, where, where there's a, there's a sort of a set narrative that you must believe. And, um, it can be difficult to sort of make sense of, of, of input of data that contradicts that. Well, I, I was also intrigued about the discomfort of black evangelicals, who remain in the church, and even black evangelicals who are not happy with some elements of evangelicalism, but are not willing to like do what a lot of white evangelicals did. I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that they see a lot of white evangelicals who become ex-evangelicals just going from like one wh primarily white space to another primarily white space. And that was just fascinating for you to lay out. And I'd like you to talk more about that. That has been one critique. And I think it's a fair one of some of the ex-evangelical communities. I mean, the church is famously de facto segregated, right? I mean, Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King talked about this decades ago about the, the segregation of the Sunday morning hour. And it is something, as I write in the book, that um, many churches have tried to address. And I think, I think quite sincerely, you know, I remember talk about this in my church, my very conservative, charismatic evangelical church in the 90s, but the pastors would talk about wanting to be more integrated and, and have relationships with black churches. Um, and yet, in, in reality, there's such a long history of segregation and discrimination. Some of the tr Christian traditions um, in, in this country have, you know, racist histories. Uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, you know, was created uh, by people who didn't want, who, who supported slavery and didn't want their churches to oppose it. Uh, the SBC, you know, apologized for that in the 1990s. It's important to, to say. But there's this really layered, complex, you know, cultural and racial history around the American church. And... In, in the chapter where I talk about black evangelicals, I spoke to several who had spent time in primarily white evangelical spaces in seminaries or churches, um, and many times that had tried to make an effort to be more integrated and, and fundamentally found that, you know, simply adding black pastors to your roster doesn't mean you're really listening to the concerns of black Christians. And, um, and this really kind of came to a head for some of them with the election of Trump, with the uh, police killing of George Floyd, and even the COVID pandemic, just um, a sense that that some of the churches that were predominantly led by white pastors were not taking some of their concerns seriously. Were Especially after George Floyd, was there a lot of like promises by primarily white evangelical churches to be more inclusive, and then that just didn't materialize four years later? I mean, mm -hmm. there was talk about it, and, and including you know, people like Franklin Graham, who was very conservative, spoke out quite quite forcefully um, about the killing of George Floyd. But I think what I heard from the the black evangelicals that I spoke to was was the sense that you know fundamentally, if if the theology doesn't change, if the if the if the leadership doesn't change, it's it, there's a difference between really changing and paying lip service to something. And I think you know, again, it's such a long history; it's it's difficult to change overnight, but. Um, what I talk about in the book is a, is a movement by some of these 
black Christians to to quote unquote leave loud. They they were they they were saying some of our our co congregants are voting for policies that are harmful to us, and we are going to leave these spaces and we're going to say so. Um, and and you know Dr. Jamar Tisby, who is a historian and and has a podcast and and does a lot of great work around these issues. You know, he said many many people in in his spaces sort of talk about decolonizing Christianity rather than deconstructing, which is sort of a buzzword in in some of these spaces. This idea that um, you know these tradition traditions that have grown up with only certain voices platformed, and I would include male voices as well as opposed to female. Um, you know, that shapes the way that you that shapes what you prioritize and it shapes what you think is important. So I will have several more questions for you, but I think this is a good point to turn to our audience and have them ask questions to Sarah. So raise your hand and we will get to you. So in the mid uh, 1980s, I moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan, <clears throat> uh, which is a very evangelical area. And I'm very much interested in comparative religion. And I, so I paid attention to what was going on around there. And James Dobson was particularly big at that time. And I could hear as I listened to him uh, with his guests and things like that, uh, that, you know, the, the strong-willed child that which you mentioned and uh, dare to discipline. And, and you do a great job on talking about that. And then he also, you began to hear from this political thing, uh, political and having people on in there, they're constructing the theology that leads the evangelical church to be able to support someone like Trump today. Uh, you know, the whole idea of, you know, God using, you know, weak people or something like that. You know. So my question is, did all of that really change the evangelical church? You know, the James Dobsons in their, in their uh, courting of the power politics that they were getting themselves involved in. Was there, was it, do you think that made a difference? I don't know if it changed it. I think it shaped it for sure. Um, you know, I, I, there there is a long history that led to this moment. And, you know, there is a history of people who called themselves evangelical or would be considered within that tradition advocating for what we would call social justice causes. So this isn't the only way to be Christian or even evangelical. Um but, you know, as I talk about in the book and I and I draw, from, I'm also not a historian in addition to not being a theologian, but I draw from some really excellent historians, including including um, Kristen Cobas Dumay and Randall Balmer and others who've documented, you know, the the way that around the time that schools began to be integrated um, the and, and also around the time that that the country became, was becoming more racially diverse. And also we were starting to see a slow decline in uh, religiosity, which is escalated considerably today, um, we started to see the rise of this moral majority movement and others associated with it, trying to mobilize primarily white evangelicals around conservative political causes. And obviously, they did that quite successfully. You know, I mean, when I was in, a little kid in the 80s, Dr. Dobson, as we called him, uh, and my husband, who is not does not have an evangelical background, laughs at the fact that I still say Dr. Dobson, but that was like how big of a figure he was in our house. You know, he was somebody who was providing parenting advice on the radio and telling like great stories about how God had helped people with their lives. And it was kind of lovely. And then it it did sort of shift into this political project, um, which was already ongoing um, and led by primarily by others like like Falwell. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think obviously it had it had an impact. And we do hear today we hear um, many evangelicals say things like God uses flawed people. Um, we don't need a pastor, we need a president. And and so that kind of thinking, I think it, it, it has deep roots. And before we ask the next question, I always found it interesting, the last Democrat to win a majority of the popular vote in Missouri was Jimmy Carter. And I don't think it's any coincidence it was him, given that his faith was a big part of who he was. And Missouri was a more democratic state in 1976. And that was also a turning point, you know, from Carter to Reagan. There was, that was kind of when the evangelical movement started to shift to the right. In your experience of, of talking to so many ex-evangelicals, can you even hazard a guess as to, like, what, what percentage of them uh, left for these, like, you know, social issues and how many of them left because they came to understand that Christianity just wasn't true. Like the Bible wasn't true and Christianity wasn't true. It depends on the person. I don't, I don't have a number. Um, and I think, you know, some people I talk to 
are not religious anymore. Some are agnostic or atheist. Um, others are, you know, have have come to a different kind of relationship with their faith. Maybe mainline Protestants, or um, you know, there are evangelical churches or evangelical in flavor that are trying to be more progressive politically and theologically. Um, and so, you know, the book is really it's about coming from a same background and leaving it, and where people end up is is varied. But I would say that most people I talked to had some feeling of hypocrisy or being lied to or misled. Now, whether that leads them to think it's all ridiculous or it just leads them to, to shift the way they think about their faith, it depends on the person. Hi. Um, when in your reporting did you realize you had a book project? When did you go from reporter to the book idea? Um, it was it was really after I finished covering the 2016 campaign. Um, it was... It was a weird trajectory and a little uncomfortable, and it's still a little uncomfortable, but I, you know, I had really stopped identifying as evangelical in my early 20s, and so this was, we're talking a good 10 years later that I'm covering the Trump campaign. And I had been hired by, I had been at member stations, NPR member stations, three of them, and then I had been hired by NPR specifically to cover that campaign. I didn't have an assignment till I got there, and I was told I was going to cover the Republican primary, and then... You know, I spent time with Carly Fiorina. I spent time with Ben Carson. I spent time with everybody. And it was just, it was Trump, you know. And and I think we didn't see that coming, but that was what wound up happening. And so much of the story did wind up centering around the evangelical movement. And I found myself kind of go, going, well, you know, I really know this world well. I understand the language they speak. I understand the metaphors. I understand the scriptural references I hear randomly at events. Um, and, and, you know, at times it felt like, am I too close to this? But I think we've in journalism we've moved away from the idea that you, that anybody's truly objective or has no backstory and and so I just you know try to sort of keep my journalist hat on and 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 report the same way I would for anything else but I think it was when I sort of stepped away from it and I started thinking reflecting more on on what I had seen as a kid and then what I'd seen on the campaign trail and getting lots of questions about that intersection from people who knew I started thinking you know I think there's something I want to say and then seeing so many ex evangelicals processing their own experiences in public added this other layer and I decided I, I really want to do my own story in conversation with with others. Yeah, before we get to questions again, I actually have a follow-up to that. I'm a, I'm a very, very busy political reporter and you're a very, very bu busy political reporter. And the thought of like writing a book while I'm doing journalism is exhausting. So how did you motivate yourself to actually finish this when you may want to come home and the last thing you want to do is write? Um. It was a combination of very healthy, constructive habits and very unhealthy habits. Um, <laughs> a couple of things. So I, I started in like 2017, I started sort of journaling some of my, just writing down my memories because I wanted to get them down. A lot of this experience had triggered a lot of memories. And so I had some things kind of like in a rough form already years before I got the book contract. So that helped. Um, and then when I got the book contract, my editor, Hannah Phillips, who without whom this book wouldn't have happened because she saw my proposal, totally got it, got the vision. Um, then I had to actually write the book. And <laughs> we were talking one day and she was like, so what are you going to do next? And I, I was like, I think I'll do this for chapter 14. And she's like, no, let's put together a calendar. So the short answer is a very rigid calendar, a lot of late nights, um, and then a lot of like Diet Coke and Haribo. Well, you've, you've given me inspiration, although I don't drink Diet Coke. Continue. <laughs> Could you say more about the uh, black church and the movement that's happening, the decolonization, decolonizing faith, and compare and contrast that to the white evangelical movement that you're seeing? Well, I think the, the reason that I put white in the subtitle is because, you know, it's really interesting if you look at black and white Christians, and of course there are other kinds of Christians too. The Latino church is, is one of the thriving spaces in evangelicalism, and uh, I'm not an expert on it, and I, I wish I would have, could have talked more about it, but I, I felt like you know I had to constrain the scope a little bit. But um, speaking specifically about the, the black church, you know what we find is that people who have very similar theological views on paper vote very differently and, and have for a long time. And I think what that speaks to is, again, what I was saying earlier, that what we prioritize, what we value in our religious spaces is often not just driven by theology. It's driven by our life, ex our lived experience. And um, and I think that's what, you know, some of these 
um, writers and pastors that I interviewed were really pointing to. Did you talk to people about January 6th, 2021? Uh, do you have any insights on reactions to those events, either within the evangelical church or in the ex evangelical community? Thanks. It came up. It came up as a concern. Um, and it was, it was really, for me, one of the reasons I decided to go ahead and finish the book proposal and do it. Um, because I had been, you know, my one concern was, as a journalist, you never want to say too much. I... Um, I, I really try to keep my journalist hat on, and, and mostly in this book, I'm describing what I've seen and what other people have seen, and there's some analysis, but you won't find me telling you who to vote for, what party to support, what what policies to support. I, I don't do that, or what to believe religiously. I don't do that. I don't want to do that. Um, but I was thinking, as I was thinking about writing something that was so in, intertwined with my personal life, I was a little concerned about how to walk that line, and I just felt like when people literally marched toward the Capitol with crosses and signs that said, Jesus saves, and then engaged many of them in an insurrection. Um, it, it was sort of like, well, the dots have been connected. I don't have to connect the dots. They've, they're, they're right there. Um, and I felt like, you know, this was the time I wanted to say something. So for me, it was kind of a catalyst to, to go ahead and, and do this project I'd been thinking about for a while. Um, and, and it, it I'm trying, I don't remember, I'm trying to remember a specific interview, but it's certainly something that came up. I mean, it, people I talked to were just like, how could, how could this, these motifs and these ideas that we take so seriously be employed in this way? Well, if I can interject, this book is intensely personal. Like you, it features details about your childhood, your teenage years, your relationships, your professional life. Was there any difficulty in incorporating so much of yourself into this book? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Explain why. Um, I mean, I, I lost sleep over that. Like, how much should I say? How much should I disclose? Um, I talked to my husband about it a lot and also um, some of my family members. And um, not everyone's happy with the decisions I made. But, um, you know, I've had a lot of time to sit with it. And I, 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 did, I narrated the audio book in December and had a time, you know, I'd had some distance from the manuscript because really the last many months are just revisions and editing. And just going through it from front to back, I really felt like, yeah, I said what I needed to say. Um, you know, a couple things. I cover, I have covered so many issues as a journalist where people are bare their souls for me. They talk to me when they're unemployed. They talk to me when they're having an abortion. They talk to me when their house has been destroyed by a hurricane. And I thought, I know the power of telling your truth. And I thought, if I'm going to do a, a book that is about why people break often painfully from their religious traditions, I needed to, I needed to tell the truth. And so, you know, unsurprisingly, some of the things that caused me to make that break were very painful. And, and I do talk about them. Um, but, you know, I, I think I feel okay about it mostly. Yeah. One of the things that I uh, observe in evangelicalism is a history of homiletics, of preaching that can be very strident, sometimes yelling, uh, fear in the preaching that um, is a way of manipulating people. And when you were mentioning Dr. Dobson, one of the things that came to mind was also a transition between the, Do the Dobson kind of radio and the Rush Limbaugh kind of radio, and the sense in which the stridency um, the almost abusive, angry man voice um, that was sort of a subtext of preaching in a lot of my experience sort of became uh, a national conversation. And what struck me about that as a woman was the sense in which there could be uh, a, a kind of abusive codependent relationship that can happen for women in that kind of patriarchy language that is so strident. So anyway, I would welcome your thoughts. No, it's, it's an interesting point you make, because it's true. Um, you know, James Dobson, his tone, by and large, was pretty warm, um, you know, whatever his political positions were. But his, his tone was often quite gentle. And, um, and then, you know, Rush Limbaugh never, I don't think, ever claimed to be a, a Christian. In, fa in many ways, he kind of, I feel like, foreshadowed Trump, because he was very brash, often crass, cursed. I remember being surprised sometimes that my dad would listen to him, because he did all the things we weren't supposed to do. But he... <laughs> He, they, they aligned ideologically, and that seemed to be enough. And I think, you know, I think there's a certain excitement sometimes in listening to something like that. You know, it gets, it gets your blood boiling. It's, it gets your heart rate up. Um, you know, how that intersects with churches, I, 
I mean, I, you're making me think about like Mark Driscoll. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's a high profile evangelical pastor who's very well known for his sort of brash rhetoric. And yeah, I think that that kind of that kind of presentation wasn't wasn't normal and typical when I was growing up, but it seems to be in some circles now. So you make an interesting point. The first of many moments that I that caused me to stop and think in reading the book was uh, the dedication. And if it's not too personal to ask, I'm interested in two parts of the, the short dedication. The first is that you mentioned your kids, and um, I have no uh, shared experience in religion at all. But what I am is a parent of <laughs> kids like you are. And, and so I'm interested in how having grown up in a way that restricted your ability to kind of be a free thinker has influenced the way you encourage your children to kind of explore their worlds. And then the second part of it was uh, an acknowledgement that as a parent, we're doing the best we can. And it struck me um, because I have to think that that would be extended by you also to your parents in a way that I think might be hard to do given how um, their choices have impacted your life. So if you'd speak to either of those things, be interested. Yeah, I, I dedicated the book to to my children and to my husband and to my former spouse, um, and and I and I said, you know, in the front, I say to my children um, who remind me that parents are doing the best they can because I think that's an important part of this. I mean, um, I say plenty of things. Uh, I had to talk about my parents to talk about my childhood. That's inevitable. Um, I didn't write the book to offend them or hurt them, but um, but you know that's part of the story. And I do think that you know many people in the rank and file in these communities are just trying to just trying to figure out how to live well. They want to raise. I mean, so much of the literature that that people like James Dobson and others produced talked about raising children who you know would turn out to follow God and would turn out well, and you know they wanted healthy families, and those are good desires. Um, as far as the second part, I think, you know, one of the, there's a, there's a chapter on parenting and one of the themes in talking to people who've left highly, um, structured religious environments is that when you become a parent, then you do have to figure out what to do with your kids. And, you know, that, that's something I have kind of complicated feelings about. I, I had my kids baptized in the Episcopal church because it felt like a place where I could, they didn't care too much what I actually believed, and it was a way to sort of bring them into. Sorry if I'm slandering Episcopalians, but it seemed like a place where I was, where it was okay to like, you know, to be uncertain, and um, and and I felt welcomed. And um, my, you know, I wanted to bring my kids into the Christian community, but in a way that felt uh, acceptable and authentic for me. And so I did that. Um, and you know, we, but we're not nearly as observant as I was growing up. And so. Um, you know, but it's been interesting to see them. They're growing up very differently than I did, and I think they they don't seem they don't seem um, stressed out about the things I was stressed out about. They seem pretty happy, and and I when we do talk about the big questions, I just try to be honest and tell them, you know, this is what I was taught. This is what I don't know, because um, I don't know what else I can do. I can't. I don't want to lie to my children about what I think. Well, I have one more question for you before we let you go, and uh, it's it's mentioned in your book of how I, I don't know if this was your experience, but a lot of evangelicals are shielded from popular culture, and they kind of are in their own evangelical pop culture. I'm curious, when you were younger, were you allowed to see Joseph in the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat? <laughs> Or no. was that banned because it's the Old Testament? Oh, the Old Testament is fine, but it was, it was, it was, a, I think it would have been unscriptural, like not an accurate depiction. It was blasphemous or something yeah, like that. Yeah, something like that. Um, yeah. And you know, it's funny, like the, the kids I grew up around, some were, some were parents were more lenient than mine. Some, not many were less lenient, but, um, but, but there was, you know, there was a, I mean, Focus on the Family has like whole columns, like telling parents what's okay to watch and what's not. And, 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 and look, like I'm a parent. We all have to protect our kids. I, I am sympathetic to that. But but yeah, for, for me, there was not a lot of, there was kind of a, a distant relationship to pop culture. Well, I, 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 I grew up in suburban Chicago when Joseph Mania was running wild. Donny Osmond was Joseph, which is kind of funny because he's Mormon and that's a story about uh, Jews, basically. But um, thank, I, I, I was able to experience it in its glory and I hope everyone else is too. I want to just... Everybody give a round of applause for Sarah. Politically Speaking is produced by Sarah Kellogg, Rachel Lipman, and me, Jason Rosenbaum. The show is edited by Fred Ehrlich. Read all of our coverage at stlpr.org. 
And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to Politically Speaking by searching the term Politically Speaking on Apple Podcasts. If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio.